So thank you very much, uh, Alan, for uh, the invitation for um, <clears throat> Critical Path, um, you know, to give a presentation here. So I'm Martin Muller. I'm the scientific director for the Critical Path um, for Parkinson's, which is part of the Critical Path Institute. You may never have heard of that uh, institute or that consortium. Um, and I'll start first with laying out the problem. And then I'll give an explanation of what this consortium is and what we do and how we tie in to providing solutions for that particular uh, problem. So bear with me on this journey. So first of all, uh, I really want to acknowledge the Parkinson's research advocate because advocates, because that's how they went into this uh, publication. Uh, but for me, they're real scientists. That um, and this was under the guidance of uh, Kevin McCarthy. I think Gary Raffle was in this meeting. Absolutely, he's yeah. Yeah, it was in this meeting as well. So his name popping up. Who in 2020 uh, went out and said, you know, let's do an inventory of all the different uh, drug therapies that are in the clinical trial pipeline. So they did, and all of this was actually uh, triggered and, and guided by Cure Parkinson's uh, as well. So they did a tremendous, you know, great effort in going into, you know, clinicaltrials.gov where all these studies are documented, uh, reach out to sources. And they came up with these, you know, great tables of all these different therapies that were, you know, that are currently going on or that are about to read out or that are reading out. <laughs> and they provided an updated so that was 2020, so and they provided an update in 2022 because in 2021 we were all busy with COVID. Uh, and they recently came out with an uh, update in, in 2023 on that as well. And it's encouraging, it's promising. I mean, I love this visual representation of it, this you know, gigantic circle of everything that is going on both for disease-modifying treatments, which you see in the top half of the circle, as well as for the symptomatic uh, treatments. And what was really encouraging as well, that even since that last report of 2022, uh, several studies uh, completed. So more things to look at, more promise that is in the pipeline. Uh, I was at the Movement Disorder Society annual meeting uh, a few weeks ago in Copenhagen, I saw some work presented there that looked quite promising as well. So this great promise. And even better, uh, several uh, of these studies uh, actually will finish this year and uh, this year as well. So there's more to look forward um, to. Um, but several key studies uh, reported in 2022 and 2023. And unfortunately, they didn't report any positive results. They didn't show any effect on what is called the primary endpoint of their trial. How do you know that a drug works? Well, you look at a particular measure and you see if that, that improves. Now, there are many, many challenges, and some of those already have been discussed um, with primary endpoint. And actually, even uh, in the presentation by Sonia, you know, she brought it up. How do you actually measure, uh, you know, an effect of a drug? So there's many challenges there. So but when you go to the regulators, you need to commit to something. You say, this is the measure we're looking at. This is where we're going to say there's efficacy of a drug. Well, if that measure doesn't work or it doesn't show anything, that doesn't mean that other measures don't show anything. So our colleagues from Roche, and see Patrick now <laughs> there as well, who's uh, part of Roche, you know, the, um, they actually use you know, digital technologies, digital health technologies, and actually saw some signal there that was promising and decided to continue to continue to continue to trial. So this is de definitely not uh, not the, uh, the end of it. But the reality of drug development is unfortunately that there is failure and this massive failure. Uh, even if you do everything you know, to the best of your ability, best you can, 90% of clinical trials, you know, of, of clinical drug development efforts, you know, will fail. There's only very little, you know, that makes it makes it to market. 
So there's really massive efforts that you need to put into it, multiple assets that you need to pursue, and a lot of money goes into it for most of it to fail. Well, uh, even if you implement best practices, there's still many challenges to drug development. And some of that you have heard this before as well, I heard you even saying, but it's the mantra within, you know, people who, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, people who make drugs. How can we get the right drug for the right person at the right dose, at the right time, in the right final design? These are all challenges. And um, yeah, these are all challenges. And I'll address one of them. Getting it to the right person is a huge challenge. So if we look at Parkinson's disease, and we look at what is called, you know, the diagnostic accuracy, meaning that people who have Parkinson's we diagnose as having Parkinson's, and people who don't have Parkinson's, we also diagnose as not having Parkinson's, don't include them and say, well, you have Parkinson's. Diagnostic accuracy, the numbers vary. I mean, even science is not fully clear about it. But some of them say, well, it's as low as 50%. Um, I think we do better than that. Uh, some of them say, well, it's as high as 90%, but not 100%. So if you think about a clinical trial, where typically these three studies that I just showed before, each of these studies um, tested about 300 people. 300 people with Parkinson's disease were involved in these, in these studies. So you got to imagine that 10%, at best, you know, if you look at the best diagnostic accuracy, that, that is 30 people in that study actually don't have Parkinson's disease, right? So you're trying to treat something with a drug, trying to treat a disease that they actually don't, don't have, right? They might have Parkinsonism, they might have the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. There might be tremor, there might be slowness of movement, there might be falls. But if you look at the biology, if you look at, you know, you know, in the end, it's not Parkinson's disease. So 30 people in a trial of 300 that don't have a disease and don't show effect, that is really gonna affect the statistics because in the end, it's all about statistics. You need to prove the evidence of your, of your trial. So trials might fail just because you don't have the right person in your, in your trial. So, why is it actually that we don't get the diagnosis, uh, you know, right? Um, you know, why, why is it that we fail on that? And so right now, the gold standard is that we create a diagnosis based on symptoms. Mostly. You go to your primary care physician or you go to the neurologist or in the best case scenario, you go to a you know, specialized movement disorders clinic and they'll go through a whole checklist of, of symptoms. Um, and actually this, it, it's hard to read and it doesn't matter. You know, what I wanna say is look at the list, see how long it is, see how many check boxes in there. And you know, you might hit on some of these check boxes. You might not hit on some of these check boxes. And it really, you know, takes some, somebody specialized to recognize like, okay, if I look at all these check boxes, that person might have Parkinson's. Best case scenario, you get levodopa for a week, maybe you respond to that, maybe you don't respond to that, doesn't mean you don't have Parkinson's disease. But you know, all of that together, you know, an, an expert will say, well, you, 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 you probably have Parkinson's disease. The earlier you go in disease, the tougher it gets to make that, that diagnosis. We're talking about disease modification. When is it that you want to do disease modification? That is early in disease. Before the major damage is done, you want to make sure that you can slow down that damage, stop the damage, or maybe, you know, in the best case scenario, revert the damage. But the longer you wait, the harder it gets. Even early in disease, 
in disease. I mean, I was in academia before I joined uh, the, the Critical Path Institute. We did a lot of neuroimaging studies. We know that when you go to the neurologist and you get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, 60 to 80% of the dopamine in your brain is already gone. So at that time that you experience your first motor symptoms, you might have other symptoms first, but that you notice, hey, you have that little tremor thing going on, or you know, don't feel that. 60 to 80% of your dopamine is already gone. So ideally, we, were gonna, we want to go even earlier than that. We want to go when there's no symptoms, you know, when you don't recognize the disease, what they call now the prodromal phase of, of disease, where there is something going on. Some, you know, you might lose your sense of smell. You might have constipation, depression, anxieties are all kinds of signs, maybe REM sleep behavior disorder, acting out your dream. It's all signs that something is brewing, so to say, and that is perhaps the golden opportunity to start um, to start treating uh, your disease. So we know and we, we recognize that um, diagnosing a, a Parkinson's disease based on symptoms is very challenging. And the field has been thinking about this a lot. The regulators have been thinking about this a lot. And, um, you know, looking at other disease areas like Alzheimer's disease or Huntington's disease and taking those examples, we realized that maybe we should start thinking about um, diagnosing or staging disease based on the biology of the disease. Recognizing, as I just mentioned, right, something is already going on very early on. Recognizing that pathophysiology, picking up those signs, seeing where the biology is going wrong, and, and start staging in that, and start defining stages of, of disease. So uh, where we can go from, you know, what it says here, PD diagnosis based on current clinical diagnostic criteria to even earlier, the diagnose as defined by, by biology. Unfortunately, the biology of Parkinson's disease is, is very complex. And I think every scientist um, uses this one in their, in their work. You might have seen it before. But what you're looking at, you know, what goes wrong in the substantia nigra, that's just really the tip of the iceberg. There's many other things that, that are going wrong, let's uh, say. So biomarkers become more and more important. And we already spoke about biomarkers before, right? So biomarker, um, which is short for a biological marker, marker is a measurable indicator of some biological state or condition. We can start recognizing by taking a sample from your blood, your saliva, your CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. You know, that's the fluid that circulates through your spine and through your brain. Urine, um, maybe even stool. You can, you know, and start analyzing that and pick up, you know, markers of things that are going wrong perhaps in your brain or in your, in your body. Those are biomarkers, they're very important. So I was actually very worried that I had to start talking a lot about synuclein seeding assays. And, you know, I, I hardly understand it by myself. I'm not a biologist. But fortunately, I already saw three talks this morning <laughs> that very nicely explain to you what a synuclein seeding assay is. So we don't need to go there, but it's an important biomarker because the synuclein is what's in, in those Lewy bodies. And it's the Lewy bodies in the end, in, in a region in your brain called the substantia nigra that start causing damage. What is being produced in the substantia nigra? Dopamine. And the dopamine goes to your striata. And so if you start those breaking down, those dopamine producing cells, you'll get less dopamine in that particular region, which is called the striata. And so there's another biomarker, imaging, neuroimaging, 
It's called that spect imaging, dopamine transporter spect imaging, where you actually can see dopamine uh, in your brain. And so the uh, the right picture there, uh, you see those two little, I always call them, you know, accolades or commas or something like that. Uh, on the one side, um, the left side for you, you see a healthy um, uh, brain uh, on top. Um, and then uh, at the bottom on the left side, you see somebody who has Parkinson's. And you certainly can appreciate that these, you know, very vibrant, hot colors are gone. This is dopamine that has disappeared in your, in your brain. So we can recognize the resulting damage of alpha-synuclein in your brain, loss of dopamine. And so that's a, that's, that's a biomarker. All right. So you want to start using those biomarkers in, in, clinical, in clinical trials, right? You want to say, hey, you know, maybe if we start, you know, defining disease based on biology, let's start looking at these two, what I would call hallmark biomarkers, right? Damage, alpha-synuclein, and the result of it, loss of dopamine. You know, let's at least include those two in our clinical trial, right? Well, that's all great and well, but you need to um, convince the regulators as well that that's very good to, to look at because the primary mandate of the regulators is, you know, protecting the public health and ensuring the safety, efficacy, and quality of medical treatments. So, the regulators need all the evidence in the world to say, you know, it's, you know, an alpha synuclein seeding assay is something that you can include in your trial. And we have confidence, confidence in that it shows what you're telling me it should show, right? That we can make a diagnosis or that we can make some kind of cutoff and say your SAA positive, you see nuclein positive, or you see nuclein negative. Same for the dopamine, uh, dopamine imaging. Well, um, the, I think there's quotes, I forgot, Project Moneyball or something like that in the movies or maybe some other, where they say, show me the money. Well, <laughs> the regulators say, show me the data, right? So you have to show the data to provide that, that, that <laughs> confidence. And so this is where, uh, building up to it, this is where we, the Critical Path Institute, uh, come, in, come into place. How about if we get all that data from clinical trials, from the scientists that were presenting that work, their work here, people that use these biomarkers in, in their work, how about if we get that all together, standardize that, integrate that, and then sit around the table with these researchers the relevant stakeholders, <laughs> pharmaceutical industry, and the regulators, and say, let's see what this data tells us, what learnings we can have from this data, and where the con you know, can we build confidence that we can use this data? So that is what we do at the Critical Path Institute. So we lead those collaborations to accelerate drug development <laughs> and even to get better treatments for people worldwide. And so we have that collaboration between the pharma, pharma industry, patients and patient advocacy groups. And Helen is part of these discussions as well. Uh, Cure Parkinson's and many of the other uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, like the, um, our friends at the Fox Foundation, I think they will be talking uh, after this, are part of, of our collaboration uh, as well. Um, people, you know, from academia, some of the, um, you know, big names in, in Parkinson's disease research, we're all part of that, that collaboration. But most importantly, the regulators, the FDA, they're part of that conversation as well. We're a public-private partnership. We're a non-profit organization. Members are, are is, is pharma. The other half that collaborates in that is our regulators. And with everything, the purpose is to develop tools, to provide that confidence that you can use, for example, biomarkers in your clinical trials, that you can use an endpoint in your clinical trial, 
um, whatever you can think of, whatever gives confidence to pharma from a regulatory perspective is what we're trying to, uh, to pursue. So um, I mentioned, I'm actually from the critical path for Parkinson's disease, but there are actually other initiatives uh, within, uh, our, um, within our institute as well. These are different consortiums. Uh, we have a very active one on Alzheimer's disease, we're very involved in the recent approvals that you can see in, 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 the, in the Alzheimer's disease space. Um, we um, have fund for infections. Most recently, we received money for a rare neurodegenerative diseases, uh, and we'll have one for Huntington's disease as well. And I bring it up because it's quite important. Um, so, what I said, we take data, um, we integrate it, and then we use that data to provide that confidence to say, hey, we can use this biomarker. Hey, we can use this endpoint. Hey, we can use this model for your clinical trial. Hey, we can use this very innovative trial design to run your clinical trial. With everything, we want, we want to give some level of confidence to that in a data-driven manner. So uh, speaking about uh, data, so across these different consortiums that I just spoke about, we call them the neurosciences or the neurological co consortiums. Um, and this is an older slide, by the way. Uh, we're up even higher numbers, but we're, you know, in total, we have, um, even, yeah, I think it's 100, 115,000 patient level, item level data points in our, in our database. Uh, a lot of that is driven by Alzheimer's disease because they have had a, a few very large clinical trials that have come to our databases. Um, but our, our Parkinson's database, for example, has close to 15,000 patient level, item level data in our data, in, in our database. So when you consent to sharing data, when you, you know, when you participate in a clinical trial, it very well might end up in, in our database. Of course, we, we don't know who you are. I mean, it's all, you know, anonymized. I mean, you never can trace it back to, to any, anybody. Um, but it's this, the collective, you know, getting all that data together that will inform, um, will inform the field. So I spoke about this, this staging, right? This is what we want to pursue now as well, this biological staging of disease. I won't go into detail about, you know, the staging model that is being proposed right now. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think our friends from the Fox Foundation are joining after that, and they probably go in into that. But as president for that, remember, I said the Huntington's, Huntington's disease. Um, in Huntington's disease, we have a consortium, the Huntington's disease regulatory science consortium. HD risk is what we uh, what we think. They developed a um, a staging scheme. Um, you know, bi biological staging of disease scheme, and which is appreciated by the regulators. They were part of these discussions. They were, you know, they gave guidance to that. That formed that staging scheme. So this can now be used in clinical in clinical trials. You can say, you know, for this stage in the biology, we need to see this and this and that, right? And maybe a few symptoms. Well, based on that particular stage, then you can get the right drug to the right person at that right time. And so that's the whole idea of a biological staging of disease. Oh yeah, so we are the critical path uh, for parts. I just wanna say a few words. Everything I spoke about was about the Critical Path Institute. We're uh, the Parkinson's disease specific uh, consortium. Um, so in, in the uh, large oval in the middle, you see all the different um, pharma companies that are part of our uh, consortium, uh, very much like, um, like any other consortium and what I laid out earlier on. Um, Nonprofit patient organizations are part of it, including Cure Parkinson's. We have a lot of academic institutions that are, are part of it. And very important, again, on the right side, the regulators. U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency are the ones that we work with. 
Uh, again, you know, it's many critical questions for design of Parkinson's disease clinical trials. I've laid out some of the general questions. Um, one that we started off the consortium with is number five here. So what are the best ways to measure disease progression? Um, so again, we started informing that uh, based on, on data, right? Because if, if we're talking about disease modification and disease modification trials, in order to know if you have success or not, if you're successful in your trial, you actually need to know what the natural cause of disease is. How does you know, your disease progress over, over time? So again, you can inform that by data, you can start looking at the data, you can create a model, and then you actually can use that model, pharma can use that model to inform their clinical trial, because they say, hey, we have a model that regulators are confident in, you know, about how disease progresses over time. We can measure the effect of our medication, our drug, against that disease progression uh, model. So this is how we uh, started off. Um, again, we're looking at what we call the early stages of Parkinson's disease. That's when we started in 2015. We called, you know, we called that red box there, early stages of Parkinson's disease, right? That is, you know, within five years after your diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. As I mentioned before, early stages of Parkinson's disease are maybe five, 10, 20 years before you get your first symptoms of, of disease. So recognizing that, and but you know, and, and just one thing, right? It becomes less and less specific, right? Constipation, I mean, if you think that constipation, if you have constipation that it will lead to Parkinson's disease, well then about, I don't know, half of the US population would develop Parkinson's disease, right? So, but everybody who has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, in retrospect, not everybody, but a large part had constipation, right? So, so it becomes less specific, and this is where biology will start helping you out. Because if you early on already can say, hey, maybe somebody lost their sense of smell, let's do a blood test or a skin biopsy, or maybe still in this case, you know, CSF, the lumbar puncture is what we have. Let's see if there's maybe alpha synuclein in there, right? If they test negative on, on alpha synuclein, then that's perfectly fine. But if you test, test positive on alpha synuclein, then you start developing a window where you can start looking at disease modifying treatments, where maybe if the drugs are out there, you can start giving those, those drugs. So this is our database, I uh, already mentioned that before. Uh, so I think we're up to 15,000 uh, patient level, item level um, uh, observations. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, our database includes some of the other, you know, large efforts that are going on. You might have heard of the BPMI study that our friends at the Fox Foundation uh, run. And there's a lot of um, British cohorts in there uh, because we received our initial funding from Parkers in UK. So they were able to tell their cohorts, hey, you need to donate your data and a lot of clinical trials that read out and they said, you know, here are the results of our trial and you can have a free database because by sharing this data and making it available to you and others, we all collectively move forward as, as, uh, as a field. So successes, uh, most recently, our most recent success, we had other ones too, but I just wanna highlight this, this one in particular. In 2022, we received a letter of support from the EMA, European Medicines Agency, that said that disease progression model that we're just talking about, we support it. You're doing the right thing. You have no substantial you know, problems with it. Just get a little bit more data, think about a few other things, but this is the way to go. So that's really you know, a real endorsement. It gives confidence. You can start using that, the disease progression model. And so really uh, what we need to do is get all together, create that confidence. And I'm very happy that a lot of our patient advocacy uh, groups are involved in this as well. Uh, together, um, like, again, Cure Parkinson's, uh, together with our friends at the Fox Foundation, 
where they, you know, where we start thinking about, you know, developing this new, what it's called drug development tool, this, this staging system based on disease biology, not symptoms, but just start looking at disease biology that might help us in, you know, getting the right drug for the right person at, at the right time. And that is called, you know, precision uh, medicine. So um, how do we do that? Share data, get together, collaborate, compete with each other on the molecule, on the drug, make all your money there, and get together to work and collaborate on the tools. Because if we're, you know, the unity and say, hey, these are the biomarkers we're using, hey, these are the endpoints we're using, and we collaboratively agree on that, and, and the regulators endorse that, then we're much better on a way than everybody competing. You can compete with each other on the on, on, on the drug. That that is that's perfectly fine. So that's the end of my talk. So um, we're very happy to have people uh, living with Parkinson's. They're the front and center of, of everything. They're the front of center for the regulators. This is whole initiative called patient focused drug development. Um, you know, and that really highlights that you know we need to have the drugs that are relevant to to the patient we don't need to have the drugs that are relevant to pharma company we need to have the ones that are relevant to the patient and so this is why we need patients people living with parkinson's in our consortium as well and we're very happy to have them included Marcia, thank you sorry but is, are they? Is everybody in tune? So, if you've got FDA that's going to eventually give, allow you to put on your label that it slows the progression down or stops, which would be we don't have a drug that has right. that yet. But then, at the same time, the pharma company has to believe that that's enough that it's going to recoup its cost. Are, are they in tune with each other, or is one at a higher bar than the other? As a patient, so, I want them to <laughs> take the risk. If I'm going to take it, the primary mandate and the only mandate for the regulators is to evaluate the safety and efficacy of a drug. If you give it, is it safe? What are the adverse events? What is you know what 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 is the side effect profile? Do you have more benefits than you know than adverse events you get from a medication? And does a drug work? What does work mean? I mean, in other words, right. where... so that's why you need, for example, that's why you need a disease progression model, right? Okay. So if you talk about disease modification, right, that's yeah, that's right. You, you I mean, disease Parkinson's is disease progressives, right? It goes, you know, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse, right? You need to understand that slope first, have confidence in that slope to know that your that your drug works, that flattens the slope. Um, or stops it altogether or pushes the slope down, right? But working, you know, what, what does it mean if a drug works? You need to provide the evidence, you need to provide the data, and this is what it, what it looks like, right? Yeah, yeah I, I wonder how you're ever going to be able to have a progressive model. Like we look at, you know, Dan was diagnosed in 2011. We know other people diagnosed in 2011 who have progressed far, far more rapidly than he has. So I just don't know how you say what's yeah, normal. No, and right, these are absolute challenges within the within yeah. right. And that's why we start, that, that's why you have this whole biological staging model of disease, right? What, how, you know, what is the biology? What is going wrong in the biology, right? But also, where are you with your some of your symptoms, right? And mm -hmm. that will define the stage of your of your disease. And within that within that particular stage, the disease slope might be different mm -hmm. than in in another stage. So you start refining it, right? And and also one measure, especially with a disease that is so heterogeneous as Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease, one measure is not gonna come in. It's many measures that will tell you yeah. the complete story. That is precision medicine, right? This is why you need biomarkers. That's why people, um, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the conversation, are even looking at digitals, right? Having, you know, 
watches on and get continuous measurements of how you move through your daily life, you know, are you maybe slower at, at, a, at a given point, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a combination. Yeah. It's not just one. Easy. No, it, no. <laughs> I'm glad you glad you recognize that from my talk. It won't it won't be easy. Um, but if everybody goes at it alone, you're not getting anywhere. And that's why you need to collaborate. That's why we have this institute. And that's why, to the credit, all the pharma companies are part of it as well because they realize that too. So, Martin, thank you so much. Really. <laughs>